I think we'll begin. Good morning and welcome to the Atlanta Council. I'm Steve Grundeman. I'm the Lund Fellow for Emerging Defense Challenges here at the Council. I'm also the producer of this Captains of Industry series, uh, the, the next iteration of which, and we're well into uh, the, the, the second dozen of these uh, over the couple of years that we've been doing it. Um, is gonna happen here this morning. Uh, that's our purpose, is to hear from a panel of space leaders, of uh, business leaders in the space sector, I should say, um, who have come here to talk about uh, what, what I call the space race in business. Um, the panel uh, comprises, and, and they'll be here on the stage momentarily, but let me just uh, reiterate, though I know those of you here in the room have this on a piece of paper, uh, Paul Demorski, who is the CEO of Artel, a ComSat services company, uh, Jay Gibson, he's the CEO of XCOR, uh, a new business developing a spacecraft that will enable suborbital and then orbital business services. Uh, Clay Mori, the president of Air Ariana Spas Inc., uh, the U.S. subsidiary of the pan-European space launch company. Um, Kay Sears, who's the president of Intelsat General, which operates one of the world's largest fleet of communication satellites, at least by capacity. Um, and Eric Thomas, a vice president in the space and missile defense business of Lockheed Martin. So um, I, I belabor uh, the, the panel in part to make uh, the, the point of what I think is featured here in this discussion. Um, it took a while for uh, us to put this panel together because I was quite intent on trying to uh, compose a panel that, that uh, uh, addressed the whole, the whole range, the whole maybe value chain, if you will, of the space sector, you know, from launch and manufacturing of satellites um, all the way down to the other end uh, of, uh, of uh, intimate customer services and provision of services uh, that rely on space assets. Um, so, so I hope uh, the conversation, and I feel confident, uh, having gotten to know the, the, the panelists a little bit, that the, the, the conversation will allow us that, that, that full breadth of perspective about what's new in, in the space sector. And there's a lot that's new in the space sector, which is why um, I thought it would be uh, a good panel to, to bring here to this series. A couple of administrative notes to make before we, we launch into the discussion. Uh, first, the event is a, a public on the record event. And also we are live streaming it. Thank you for those of you who are watching online uh, over the Atlanta Council's website. Um, if uh, the, the panelists know this, but if I should call upon you uh, during the portion of the agenda uh, that provides for Q&A from the audience, uh, please wait for one of our staff to bring you a microphone, identify yourself, and, uh, and offer your question. Um, uh, second, uh, the second administrative note is that we are tweeting this event at the hashtag ACDefense. Uh, and the handle AC, the, our handle is AC Scowcroft. Uh, the Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security is the piece of the Atlanta Council where my fellowship in this series resides. Um, and we can even take questions uh, for the panel uh, through those channels if uh, we have staff who are uh, managing uh, those channels and can bring me a good question if it comes over, uh, over Twitter. Uh, finally, I, I, I want to emphasize the event will end at noon. So if, um, and we'll be in the midst of Q&A as the noon hour approaches. I would appreciate your help um, uh, pacing your questions, let's put it politely, to accommodate that deadline as, as, we, as we approach it. Thanks very much. So I've, I've alluded already to the fact that this event marks the beginning of the third year of the Captains of Industry series, the purpose of which is to make available what I immodestly would regard as the town's preeminent platform from which senior executives whose businesses address aerospace and defense can address the public interests their companies serve and the public policies that shape these markets. Uh, among others who have preceded this panel on the stage are Dave Melcher, uh, who then was the CEO of Excellus, now uh, as some of you may know is the CEO of the Aerospace Industries Association. He launched the series a little over two years ago. Uh, others, not least uh, uh, from the space sector who have spoken from this stage include Tori Bruno, uh, the CEO of United Launch Alliance, and Gwyn Shotwell, uh, the president uh, and chief operating officer of space, uh, space exploration technologies. Um, by engaging the perspectives of these business leaders, our, our Captains of Industry series is cultivating a constituency for practical solutions to the challenges and opportunities lying at the interface of ministries and industries. That's, that's, the, that's the theme and purpose uh, of this Captains of Industry series. As the invitation to this event stated, the space sector has, somewhat for me unexpectedly, I guess I would admit, uh, become one of the most dynamic corners of the aerospace and defense marketplace. Uh, that dynamism is marked most especially by the entry 
of new firms, uh, conceiving new products and services to address the changing tastes and preferences of business and consumers, both for information here on Earth and specialized services in space. Uh, but it's also marked by the restructuring and repositioning of established players in the market who are both defending their incumbencies and breaking into new lanes of the market themselves. Uh, not least, this dynamism is abetted by governments whose influence manifests itself both in the form of customers uh, for products and services of these companies, uh, but also as regulators uh, of, of what and how these companies conduct themselves in the marketplace. Uh, news flow this week as a for example of that, that uh, feature of the dynamism is the uh, passage, at least through the House earlier this week, of what I think is a, a conference agreement on the commercial space bill. We may talk a little about that um, in the panel discussion. Just earlier this week, it cleared the House, I would understand. Um, so a couple weeks ago, I was at a, uh, a conference, the, the Aviation Week conference um, in Scottsdale, and I saw my former colleague, Jacob Markish, um, make a presentation, a really terrific presentation that I suspect is available elsewhere on, um, on what is new in uh, aerospace and defense and to sort of uh, respond to the, uh, maybe the cynical view that, that uh, the dynamism in the defense market in particular um, has dulled. Um, Jacob has a nice antidote to that. But there were two slides in that presentation, which as I sat there, I thought, I got to use those two slides to, to, to begin this conversation. Uh, because I thought they so perfectly uh, put into perspective the, this, this range of repositioning, restructuring, and entry, um, which, which is at least uh, the dominant feature of this thing I keep calling dynamism. So I'm going to cede the stage to Jacob Markish, a terrific, uh, thoughtful, and rigorous, uh, which is a strange combination, often uh, uh, consultant and analyst uh, of the aerospace industry who, uh, who's a friend and with whom I've worked before and who I'm just going to uh, cede the stage to so that he can put this little backdrop in front of our panel. Then we'll have the panel come up. I'll, ease, I'll ask each of the panelists to uh, say something about their, themselves and their own companies um, and their perspective on, on what's new. Um, then I will uh, engage a conversation with them. And then uh, at about 11.30, uh, I'll try to open up the uh, conversation for questions from those of you here in the audience. Um, so um, uh, bide, bide your time. If you have a question burning in you at or about 11.30, I will, I will get to the audience, I promise. Jacob. <clears throat> It's working? Great. Um, thank you, Steve. Uh, I work at Renaissance Strategic Advisors. It's a consulting firm. And um, just as Steve mentioned, um, the, the animation or the inspiration behind this um, cartoon, cartoonish slide, um, has been a fair amount of work that we've done in the space sector over the last probably couple of years. And a lot of it as a consulting firm for us you know, is around helping clients to understand what is happening in the market that they serve, what is happening in the industry that they serve. And so we've had multiple clients come to us and ask us to help them think about the evolution of the space sector, of different facets of the space sector. And so this was one attempt to set the context for talking about that evolution. Um, and and what, I, what I would argue that it does is it defines or articulates a value chain in the space sector in slightly different terms than traditionally um, one might have seen. And those terms really are focused on, um, focused on the two boxes at the top, which is to say that some of the most important dynamics and imperatives driving the space sector today, more than before, are around content, around generating content and then distributing it to the final users, whether those users are in government or in private sector. Um, so what we see here is there's a range of ways that you can generate content, right? You can collect data, whether it's via satellites or even aircraft or otherwise. You store it, you manage it, you process it, generate whether it's imagery or whether it's more, more specific or more actionable information than just raw data. Then you have to distribute that, that data. Um, or that, that content, right? Whether that content is a Netflix video or a, um, or a signals intelligence <coughs> data um, or, or navigation data. And that distribution might happen in any number of ways, right? Whether it's through air and space networks, uh, fixed satellite services, mobile. It might be via terrestrial networks. It might be vi via uh, resale of bandwidth. There's a lot of different ways to distribute that data. Um, and that is what is generating the value that the end, cust end customers and, and operators really need. 
Now, the rest of the space sector, which is hugely important and, and large and well known to us in the aerospace defense industry, is in many ways subordinate um, in the eyes of customers and even investors in many ways. Um, to the content generation distribution. So we have support services, most notably launch services, how you get your assets into space, um, and then support systems, the actual hardware that you're putting into space or the software that you're using to help generate content and distribute content. So it's just a way of thinking about the industry and one that reminds us that, um, that players in the space sector are are working in a world that is larger than simply satellites and launch vehicles. And then to think about some of the specific actors who are in this sector, we've um, populated each of these boxes with a couple of examples. They're not comprehensive, they're mostly, they're more notional or representative. Um, to show some of the players that are acting and, and generating value in each of those, of those boxes, generating content, distributing it, and supporting that content generation distribution. The point to make on this slide, we've, we've thrown a ton of companies in here, um, <coughs> including all the ones that are, that are here today at the panel. The point is that in this slide, there are many non-traditional actors, non-traditional companies. Certainly we see the Lockheed Martins, the Intel sats of the world, the Boeings of the world, who have been doing this, um, a range of these different value chain tiers for a long time. But we also see a range of companies, some of which are startups, which are very new to the, to the world, and others of which have been around for a while, but have only recently gotten much more active and more prominent in this value chain, you know, whether it's Amazon or Google um, or even Facebook participating in certain parts of this value chain and all of a sudden finding themselves in competition or maybe in cooperation with uh, companies that have been around for a much longer time playing in this, uh, in this broader space sector. So that's the introduction I wanted to give. Hopefully it's, it's a useful construct to, uh, to work off of or to debate even. Um, one thing that it noticeably lacks is um, human space flight. We haven't really illustrated how some of these launch um, systems and services can translate into a human space flight. That's not, that's not content, it's, it's a whole different part of the market. Otherwise, I'll leave you with that. I'm told that we need a couple of seconds to set up the stage and then we'll have the speakers, the panelists come up. Exactly, um, thanks very much, Jacob. And uh, while they're resetting the stage, I will simply point out that from the back of the room where I've just been standing, I am aware that, that the, the uh, content, the, the high quality content of these slides is hard to see. So I've asked my staff to print these two slides and make them available to all of you who are here on the uh, credenza outside the, the room uh, as you're leaving. With, with your permission, Jacob. Of course. Yeah, okay, good. So if the panelists would please uh, come up to the stage, we will start the conversation. I'm cognizant of the fact that we have taken a fair amount of time uh, from uh, a short duration that we have scheduled for this event to set it up. Uh, I'm actually going to, uh, I'm not going to introduce uh, e each of these uh, panelists in detail uh, in, in favor of you taking the time. Uh, I know you have their, uh, maybe not their full bios, but, uh, but a summary of, of their respective backgrounds uh, available to you on a piece of paper that was uh, uh, hand it out on your, on your way in. So uh, if all of you would, would allow, I won't, uh, I won't uh, belabor their, their uh, introduction other than to say that each of them uh, has a wealth of experience in this sector. Uh, none of them are anything like what one would call green or, or new, new to uh, this, spec, uh, this sector. And in, in many cases, I, I, I know that their careers have traversed uh, uh, on beyond space and into other uh, ranges, products, and services of the aerospace and defense sector. So it's a really well-versed uh, uh, panel and uh, highly, highly qualified, great business leaders uh, in, in this sector. We're quite privileged uh, to have them all here. Um, to get uh, to, to further uh, propel the conversation, I have asked each of them to start the conversation by taking just a few minutes to introduce themselves, their companies, um, and to, to give me at least a preliminary answer uh, to what's new uh, from, from the perspective of, of their respective companies. So uh, all of you would know the, the Captains of Industry series is not an earnings call. It's not a, it's, it's not a marketing pitch, but at the same time, I always think it's important uh, for all of us to, to understand the context from which they're speaking. And so I have invited, encouraged, in fact, uh, required each of them to tell us something about their companies um, so that we know, as it were, where they're coming from. 
Um, so I'm going to try this uh, um, in, uh, from sort of upstream hardware to downstream services is the way we'll, we'll do this. And, and um, I, I suddenly realized that actually upstream clay of, of your uh, launch vehicle actually would be the satellite. And so I'm actually going to switch a little bit and ask Eric to, to kick off. And, and then we'll make our way through the rest of the, uh, of the stream, if you will. Eric. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate being here today. Um, what I would like to do is we'll give you a brief snapshot of sort of where Lockheed Martin fits in that scheme. You saw the, the logo on uh, a number of those boxes previously, so it, perhaps it doesn't require much explanation. And then talk a little bit about uh, what I see as uh, effectively a revolution in space and satellite manufacturing, uh, which is, I believe, complementary to some of the other presentations that you're going to hear uh, momentarily. So uh, last year, Lockheed Martin uh, celebrated its 100th <coughs> anniversary as a corporation. That's a, a long time to be in the uh, aerospace uh, uh, sector. Uh, a lot of scar tissue built up over those years, a lot of experience that has been built up. Um, uh, and. Uh, the point for this panel, perhaps specifically, is that we've been in the space sector since there was a space sector. We, we helped develop uh, many of the capabilities and systems that exist today, whether that be remote sensing, satellite communications. We were there from the beginning and uh, continue to be there, and I believe to be pioneers. Uh, we were pioneers and we're sort of revolutionaries today, um, uh, I, 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 I would submit. Um, the, the one thing that is interesting and perhaps relevant to this panel that I wanted to mention is for the last almost 30 years, we've seen a convergence in commercial and government space. Uh, and, and Lockheed Martin is really focused on that. We have tried to take our products that we have either developed for the government and help enable commercial uh, markets to emerge as, as a result of that, or um, inversely, take commercial products, and then provide them back to the government. The idea being that there is a significant overlap in both technology, in mission, uh, and, um, and, and in the need. Um, and also, from an industrial base, the people often have exactly the same skills. So if you're working on a commercial uh, communication satellite, one day you might be working on an Air Force um, missile warning satellite. Uh, the next week or the next day. Um, and so the industrial base is, is very dynamic. Um, you're going to hear, I believe, quite a bit about significant changes in the space sector. I won't go into the services part of this at all. Just uh, I would say that in the manufacturing world, uh, there is also a dramatic revolution that's going on in terms of how we approach design, development, and production of space <coughs> vehicles. Uh, and it is intended uh, both to serve our government customers and our commercial customers equally. Um, Lockheed Martin has developed a concept that we call the digital tapestry. And the digital tapestry is all about taking 3D uh, design capabilities, bringing those all the way through the engineering and directly into manufacturing. So in the past, we would have design, and people would do drawings, and then those would be passed on to manufacturing, and manufacturing would then sort of go, OK, well, what is this? And try to figure out how to implement that, and in many cases, spend a lot of time correcting uh, 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 problems that were not envisioned in the design phase. Uh, today, with digital design, you're able to actually walk yourself through the entire value chain, all the way through the production, uh, and even into operations to, to some extent of these satellites. Um, 3D visualization is a major tool in this process whereby you can actually uh, envision the construction, the manufacturing of satellites while they're being designed to help improve the design and to eliminate flaws in the process. So the digital tapestry, as we call it, is a, a very powerful tool. It's being implemented today. It's not theoretical. It exists. Uh, Complementing that, of course, is 3D printing or additive manufacturing is allowing us to bring componentry into the space domain that we could not have even designed in the past. You're able to overcome literally what we thought were, um, were laws of physics of what, what kind of components you could build out of certain materials, what sort of shapes could be built that would be optimized for the mission, for the capability, not optimized for the material you were trying to make them out of. So that's a, a very significant uh, development as well. Um, so for Lockheed Martin, these ideas are being implemented in a couple of different ways right now. We have taken our uh, workhorse commercial and government satellite 
uh, platform, our A2100, and we've taken that through a modernization effort over the last several years. We call that our A2100 technology refresh. The A2100TR uh, is uh, becoming a reality today. Uh, the Air Force has actually allowed us to take our most recent um, contracts that we have with them to build early warning satellites and implement that on the SIBRS program, if you're familiar with the Space Base Infrared program. So A2100TR is a reality and will be uh, uh, included into a, a key uh, Air Force program. Simultaneously, it was key to our recent um, <coughs> win of the ArabSat, a commercial communication satellite, and so A2100TR is becoming a reality in both commercial and government domains. Um, I would close just by saying uh, many people look at Lockheed Martin and say, well, you build big satellites, we know that, that's all you, you do. It, it turns out that actually Lockheed Martin has built more small satellites than any other company in the world. Uh, and recently, we had the opportunity to uh, submit a proposal which, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, turned out not to be the winning proposal, but um, a company was asking us to bid on a constellation of up to 3,000 small satellites, 150-pound class, uh, low-Earth orbit communication satellites. In a few months, we presented a proposal uh, that would have entailed um, a production run, a very much a, a like, almost like a... Um, a production, um, like an automobile production run, where we would be producing up to 50 satellites per month. Um, and the price that we were envisioning was less than $500,000 per satellite. And that was largely enabled by the, the design and this digital tapestry that I was talking about earlier. But um, it, was, uh, it was, I think, showing uh, to ourselves and hopefully to the world that uh, there is, in fact, a manufacturing revolution that's occurring, and it's going to change uh, the way we think about spacecraft, the way we build spacecraft, and the way they're operated in the future. Thank you. Okay, Eric, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to next turn to, uh, to Clay to uh, talk about uh, Ariana Spas. Thanks, and thanks for having me here today. Uh, we were talking a little bit before this panel about new space and old space and, and the, the nomenclature there. Uh, maybe Although I'm, in that conversation, I promised to call none of the panelists old space. Yeah. <laughs> So I Excuse guess me. If we were all new space, we'd be in black t-shirts, right? <laughs> yeah, and exactly. up here. Turtlenecks. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I would posit perhaps that Arian Space was the original new space company. It was actually founded uh, 35 years ago, 1980. I looked up on my phone just before the panel what the top news stories were in 1980. Uh, the presidential election, war in the Middle East between involving Iran and Iraq, mm -hmm. and increased racial tensions in the United States. I think we probably haven't moved that far in 35 years. Uh, we were founded 35 years ago <clears throat> to really be a commercially focused space company. That is, our bread and butter business is launching commercial telecommunication satellites. It has been for 35 years. It remains about 85% of our business base. That's what we do. And that's because Europe doesn't have the kind of throughput in terms of national security and civil space missions that, that would require a big launch system like what we have in French Guiana to operate today. We've, we have three systems today, the Ariane 5 the Soyuz and the Vega that all fly from the Guiana Space Center in South America. Uh, very capable systems. The Ariane 5 in its debut was about 5.7 uh, tons of performance. We've increased that performance now by over 40% uh, over the last uh, 20 years of its operation, uh, roughly 20 years. And it's flown knock wood uh, 69 times in a row uh, over the last 12 years, 100% success. So we've taken a product that was introduced, we've evolved that product uh, and, and adapted it to the marketplace. My colleagues often tell me when we started in this business, we were competing against the space shuttle, right? Then we evolved to compete against Atlas, Delta, Long March, Proton, Zenit, Falcon, all these new systems that have come into the marketplace. And we've adapted and, and we have to adapt to change. I think it was Charles Darwin who said, uh, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent that survive, but those that most that are able to adapt to change that actually are able to survive and thrive in the world. Um, so what are we doing? What's new? What are, what are we moving forward with today? The Ariane 6 is our, going to be our next evolution. Uh, it's a new launch system uh, that will be built by Airbus Safran Launchers, uh, which is uh, soon to be our majority uh, stakeholder in Ariane space. Uh, that system's going to have over 10 and a half metric tons of performance uh, going to orbit. Uh, it has solid core boosters around the, that, that main stage. These solid boosters are also going to be used for the Vega light launch system that we've put in place. Uh, and we're going to be able to get volume uh, in terms of manufacturing, production, and launch operations through that to be able to lower the price per kilogram to orbit. 
Uh, what's happening with my customer base? So I have some of my customers here uh, on the panel. Uh, we've seen a lot of evolution right now in the satellite sector. Eric talked a little bit about uh, added manufacturing and, and rapid prototyping and development, be able to take uh, new technologies in the manufacturing sector. And that's certainly going to change the speed and design function of uh, commercial satellite construction, both on the small and the larger platform. But we also see uh, the advent of electric propulsion. Electric propulsion, or, or ion propulsion, as it's often called, it's not a new technology. It's been something that's been around for a long time, but it's now being rapidly adopted by our customer base, not only for in-orbit station keeping, but for orbit raising. And so this is something that launch companies are having to evolve uh, and adapt to uh, the advent of that technology being adopted in the commercial sector. High throughput satellites. Uh, these are satellites that have 10 times or even more, in some cases 100 times, the throughput capability of existing satellites that have been manufactured. And what's that going to do to the marketplace that's, that's out there now for commercial uh, satellite services? Um, the advent of small satellites in, in large constellation formats. And this is both in the communications and the Earth observation world. And so uh, this past year, we signed two huge landmark contracts, one with a company called OneWeb that's going to be launching 900 satellites uh, into low Earth orbit to bring internet to underserved areas of the world, and another with a company named Google you might have heard of. Uh, their Skybox constellation, they acquired Skybox last year. We'll be launching some satellites next summer for them uh, on the, in the Earth observation uh, sector. So a lot going on. We now have more launches, uh, like you were saying with the small satellites, we have more launches going to low Earth orbit than we do to geostationary orbit. So it's, it's quite a change and shift for our in space, and, and we look to continue to adapt and, and try to thrive in that sector. Okay, all right, good. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip one down the row in order, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to come to Jay, um, who, if I may put it, is at the hinge between spacecraft and launch and services, um, which, which I hope you'll, you'll explain why I, why I think of it that way. Sure, well, and under full disclosure, Steve said that this was a panel of very seasoned people, uh, except for me. Uh, I've been with the company with about season, 10, 10 months, so I don't mean to insult the rest of these folks. Um, but we, we're the black t-shirt guys. We're the, we, we're the small company that I think is reflective of where this is all going on the privatized side. You have a couple guys that sat around a table a number of years ago and says, what, what is going to make space truly commercial? What, what is going to drive that? Um, and if you listen to everyone talk that is struggling in this industry to, to continue to progress, uh, you hear it constantly. It's reusability. When you get to reusability, you start to achieve what then brings us into a commercial environment, which is frequency and affordability. And when you do that, you open up the market to all kinds of interesting things. Uh, you, you, you allow the market to drive who you are and what you do. Um, so fundamental to who we are in a launch world is propulsion. And so we developed, started out developing uh, engines that are highly reusable. And when you listen to other folks talk about the current state of engines, they'll tell you, yes, we want to get to the 10, to the 20, to the 50, maybe to the 100 times. Well, what we're talking about in our technology is the thousands of times that an engine is reusable uh, and with a low service. And again, there, what we're doing is we're driving frequency and, and affordability. We've coupled that with a very simple spacecraft. And what we do that is very unique is everything is horizontal takeoff and recovery. So we can operate from a number of different fields. Uh, and what, uh, as I've said, you could very well be in an American Airlines or a Southwest Airlines plane, and then right behind you is us. Um, we're low toxicity, so you can operate in that environment. Again, what this does is drive access to first, in our case, suborbital, and then on to using this technology to an orbital environment. Uh, we really have four lines of business in our company. Uh, we sell our engines, we, we develop the technology, and then we produce these engines to support other launch environments to provide uh, a segment of, of economics there for them. We also will uh, make and produce our vehicles for others to use, uh, which would include either direct sale or a wet lease type of environment. Uh, and then we can directly provide payload deployment. Uh, 
uh, whether that's scientific missions, whether that is small sats, uh, and then the third would be a tourism type of environment. Um, one of the things we've done recently is in, in this emerging market, uh, we have to be very much market driven. Uh, and, and part of that is we have to be driven by speed to market to, to keep up with this emerging market. Uh, so one of the things we've done recently is we just had to define who we are and where we're going to go. So we did put together those four lines of business, say this is what we do. Uh, I, prior to, to being here, I was with Beechcraft. I led several business units there. <coughs> Um, and I happen to got, gotten to know our products very intimately. And, and frankly, I've described to the market, they say, well, who are you guys? I say, you know, we're the king air of space. You know, pretty simple. We, we're, we're a platform to allow mission deployment to a suborbital and orbital environment. You decide what you want on there. That's not our, our ours is to provide a mission profile that's very frequent and affordable and dependable, then allows the marketplace to say, that's a good business model for us. So that's who we are at XCOR. And though you'll sell your engines, you're going to build and operate the platform yourself. That is correct. OK. Um, I will next turn uh, to Kay Sears uh, from Intelsat General. OK. Thanks, Stephen. And thanks to the Atlantic Council for the opportunity to be on this panel. So Intelsat is. Um, we're not old space. Uh, we're old and new space, I think. We've been around for 50 years. Uh, we are very much um, in that content distribution component of Jacob's model. But instead of broadcasting 50 years ago the first uh, man on the moon video and perhaps carrying the telephone conversations between the Kremlin and the White House, that content has definitely evolved. So now our platform of 51 plus at any time geostationary satellites, as well as about 37,000 miles of fiber, uh, carries a different kind of content. Um, we carry rural telephony, for example. Let's remember there's still about 4 billion people that are not connected. And the name of the game right now for business and for, for power is connectivity. Information is, has got to move at, at the pace of business. And so when I think about the kinds of traffic we're carrying today on that platform, that global platform, we're still trying to work to connect those 4 billion people with some of the most basic uh, telecommunication services. So rural telephony would be one of those. But then you have a whole host of new applications that are driving content. Uh, the Facebooks and the Googles, but, but everything that's going across the internet. Even in the video domain, we're carrying uh, MPEG-4 video, we're carrying three-dimensional video. For the US government, if you think about some of the applications there, what the Predator and the Reaper are trying to uh, transmit off of those airborne platforms. As you fly from here to California and you use your Wi-Fi uh, on the plane, uh, that's going up and over satellite. So all of these new applications um, are very content laden. They require uh, a very cost effective and global distribution network. So Intelsat is focused on uh, keeping pace with that content distribution theme. And some of the things that are really driving that, I would say, would be mobility. Everybody wants to take all their content with them wherever they're going. And that requires more powerful satellites. It requires a lot of new innovations on the ground and in the handheld uh, devices. So some of the things that my colleagues have talked about, let's talk about the satellite itself. Um, huge innovation happening there in terms of the digitalization of satellite components. Uh, the ability to build a satellite now that has 10 times the throughput uh, that, a, that a satellite had in the past. We're also seeing a lot of software defined. Let's remember this market changes incredibly fast. No one can predict anymore what applications will drive the business in five years. So we're really pushing our manufacturers to come up with very flexible payloads that we can reconfigure on orbit to address those new applications or where the populations and demand happens to be. We're driving our launch partners like Clay to really come up with very affordable, flexible, and rapid uh, access to space. 
Um, so those are some of the things, metamaterials as an example, we're driving uh, new uh, user terminals down to a very small size, we're putting them on planes, we're putting them on trains, we're going to put them on cars. So all of these things are driving uh, huge new content, massive content, not even to mention in the future that our refrigerator is going to talk to our iPhone and we're going to have to carry that kind of traffic too. So Inelsat is making um, some, some bets in this new space environment. We're investing in companies like OneWeb. We see very complementary uh, networks between Leo and Geo. We're investing in companies like Kaimeta and Phaser to drive the user terminals uh, so that people can stay connected no matter where they are and where they're moving. So those are just a few things that, uh, that Inelsat is doing to keep pace with this, uh, this new space business. Okay, that's terrific. All right, and then all the way down at the end of the, uh, uh, or up at the end of the stream uh, would be a, a company like Artel. Um, uh, Paul? Well, thanks, Steve. Thanks again for the invitation. So when Jacob showed you the chart, we're in the upper right-hand quadrant. So as I look to the kind of the left and I look to the right, we have no satellites. So maybe I'm in the wrong room. <laughs> but uh, having, having said all of that, um, you know, knowing that I'd be on a panel like this, we we manage between two and three thousand, or between two and three gigahertz worth of satellite capacity. So that equates to something like 25 satellites, 50 transponders. We are the largest uh, provider of satellite services to the Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security. So while, while the, the satellite is important to our customers, it's all about the application. It's all about you know, a, a dangerous world. It's all about the things you see about in the news. It's all about what happens with uh, drones, what happens with EUAVs, and the impacts of satellites on those, which are best. Our customers come to us and they ask us to be able to, you know, they're like every other customer. They want the most for the least, and they're under pressure because of budget issues that are going on. So they come to us and say, listen, here's my application, here's where I need your expertise and I need your help in being able to, to meet the demand because they're, they're patriots. They're people that are trying to keep us all safe and we try to help them every way we possibly can. So that constitutes being able to blend technologies for them. Sometimes we take two satellites that, 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 are, that have different complementary things. We provide it to them as kind of a, a package. Sometimes what's increasingly they've come to us about is saying, listen, here's my need. And while I may not be able to afford SATCOM, uh, I need some terrestrial to be able to put together with that so I'm able to provide more of a solution for them so they're able to deal with their budget woes that they have today that's out there in the market. So we've kind of morphed from being almost exclusively a SATCOM provider to being able to provide terrestrial networks. So we have an MPLS network that's over in, uh, mostly over in the unsafe areas. And we, you know, we put circuits in to, through partners in places like Iraq and Bahrain and all those kinds of places so that when they come to us um, that we have some other capabilities to help them in that area. So we are a terrestrial provider for Department of State. We are a terrestrial provider to Social Security Administration, helping them with, again, uh, providing some SATCOM solutions with some terrestrial things <coughs> that, they're, that they're seeking. So our goals are just to continue to know what's out there. So that's why I was encouraged to be able to be here today to hear about all the new things that are happening in the market and then being able to have kind of conversations with our customers to talk about some of those changes that are happening in the market. The K's got some, some new technology that's coming on. We've been talking to some of our customers about that. I'm sure there'll be some other things that we'll have uh, in the future to be able to talk to them about as well. And you know, we're trying to do things like uh, provide subscription services to them. Some of them don't want to be in the business of maintaining terminals, don't really want to be in the business of being able to buy bandwidth. They just want a solution. So some of our things we've had conversations with them are in that kind of context. And it's all about, um, you know, what, what the Department of Defense and Homeland Security is looking for us to go ahead and go do. So we have, you know, lots of conversations at Army bases and all kinds of places like that understanding what their needs are and then helping to work with them to create the best possible solution for our customers. 
Okay, terrific. Um, I, I wonder if I could start the conversation by uh, simply remarking upon that, you know, dynamism, this word I keep attributing to the sector, I think correctly, um, uh, generally is correlated with, with growth or at least change. And so could one or more of you give us a sense, either in dollars or bandwidth or headcount or something, of the pace of growth of this industry, say, over the next five years? What's, well, let, let me ask it this way, um, uh, either in your business or yours, what's the capacity, how is, how is the capacity of a given satellite uh, changing uh, to, to accommodate that growth? Okay, you can talk about yeah. Epic, maybe. Yeah, so our, our Epic platform, which we are launching the first one with Clay in January, uh, will have about 10 times the throughput, total throughput, and the way that we do this is through uh, the creation of multi-spot, a multi-spot pattern across the coverage. So instead of a wide beam satellite, you know, like you might have one beam over the United States, we have a lot of smaller spot beams. That does a couple of things. First of all, it increases the, the downlink power so that you can use much smaller antennas. Uh, but it also allows us to reuse the spectrum over and over again. So the total throughput of the satellite goes, goes up, and that means the cost per bit delivered for our customer goes down. And this gets at the affordability, because I think it's not just in the launch business where we need to be affordable. We have to be affordable on the platform side. Affordability will drive new applications, especially applications like the Internet of Things. So the epic constellation that we're building right now and will launch over the next few years will really target mobility and these new kinds of Internet of Things applications. Okay. If, if, if I were to say, um, right, I'm not the guy on the panel who has a long uh, history in, in the space sector, although I know a thing or two about it, but, but allow me sort of the, the uninitiated question. I'm hearing about millennium, a millennium. I'm hearing about one web. I'm hearing about space box. Um, are those the most interesting things? Or, or you know, put those in context. Um, is that a, a, the most interesting new thing going up into space? Is it um, just another thing? Can put, put those things that we do, you know, the uninitiated hear a lot about these uh, services, if only because the count of satellites that they're talking about is astounding. Um, how should we understand the, 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 that news flow? Well, I, I would say that this, so, so back in- OneWeb. Yeah, yeah. OneWeb, so we're, we've done a contract to launch. We have 21 launches for OneWeb, which is over 600 satellites that we're gonna put into space. In 21 launches? In 21 launches, right? That's, the, that's their initial, con uh, initial constellation deployment. Virgin Galactic has uh, another, I think, 39 launches that they're gonna conduct, uh, much mm -hmm. smaller. We're gonna put 30 plus satellites on a single booster to put them into space mm -hmm. and try to launch them in about an eight, 18 month period of time. So that's a huge, uh, deployment uh, very rapidly and, and, a, and a system that's going to cover the globe. Kay mentioned about four billion, three, four billion people in the world do not have uh, broadband access because fiber doesn't get to where they are in remote places of the world. And right. so these companies are trying to bridge that divide. They're using a combination of small satellite technology that, that Eric talked about uh, with a rapid production line uh, and capability in these satellites that was here before you couldn't put it in that kind of a small package. Uh, something in 150 kilogram or less uh, package. Mm -hmm. You're talking about an evolution on the ground in terms of the antenna design, uh, and then also using WiMAX, Wi-Fi, uh, LTE, 4G type networks on the ground to distribute that content so you don't have to change your phone on the ground. You know, we have tablets now that are Fire tablet from Amazon is less than 50 bucks, right? right? So you can overcome the price point on the ground. You can even have even uh, uh, smartphones that are, that are much cheaper than that. Uh, in the marketplace to be able to access the internet with a mobile platform. And satellites, because of their unique capability, be able to connect areas to where it's too expensive to run fiber, uh, could really be a game-changing technology in these areas. And so connecting those people, I think, potentially has a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, growth for the industry. Uh, I haven't seen any studies that really talk about the, the actual figures there, but um, certainly there's a ton of investment that's going into this sector. I think the other thing is, is these Earth observation platforms that are out there now. Right. And that's okay. not only the technology involved in building a small satellite. So Skybox, for instance, the satellite could, you know, it's not quite on this table, but it's about this big by this big, their mm -hmm. spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And it has sub one meter resolution capability. So it's really a, a fantastic, now there's some physics involved, right, with, with optical satellites, but it's really a, a quite a capable system. But really the heart of that is in the software on the ground and their ability to fly a complex constellation with very few people. And so the ability to take the, the, the ones and zeros that are coming from space to be able to manipulate that data in a way 
and using computing technology and software, advanced software and computing technology to be able to take that data and make it into something where there's a value chain value added on that, that they can sell that data or use that data in a way uh, that's going to make money for the end user with right. the end user. Right. So that, that really is what I think is changing the equation. Okay. I just think another symptom of this new space business. So you have a very established operator like Intelsat investing in OneWeb. So, okay, I wanted to pull right, that thread because right? so, you'd alluded to so it. So why? Why would we invest in why, OneWeb? Why are you investing in OneWeb? Well, let me tell you why. <laughs> so so we, see, we see OneWeb as very complementary to our, our geo system. Just for what Clay is talking about, you know, let's keep in mind, OneWeb is as much a wireless play on the ground as it is in space. Hmm. And that's another really important component of this new space business. Satellites are incorporated in into the ground network. We don't, you know, we can't separate the space and ground layer anymore. We really have to combine them in. So we're, so OneWeb is, is going to do a great job collecting all of that local access. And some of that access is destined for places other than the local community. And that's where the satellite component comes in. And we're both at KU Band. Much of the Intelsat network is at KU Band. OneWeb is also going to use KU Band. And we're, we'll be developing terminals that will be able to work Leo and Geo at the same time. So this is a whole new you know, revolution in terms of how we're going to be able to move data around using LEO and GEO space uh, to do that. So we, don't, we see OneWeb as, as a partner. And I think that's another symptom of the new space business. It is all about partnerships. It, mm. It's expanding so rapidly and changing so rapidly. One company cannot address all these users at, at you know, on their own. So you, you really need to partner and, 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 and be creative in how you combine your networks and your capabilities. And do you, Paul, Paul, you alluded to the fact that you were working both terrestrial solutions and, and commsat solutions uh, in a manner that might be uh, transparent to the customers, actually. Yeah, they, they, they really don't want, I mean, when they come to us, they're looking for more of the solution. Yeah. They're, looking, they're looking for us to, they're obviously very interested in all the things that we're talking about today. They're, they're, they're very, you know, our customers are very educated, they're very knowledgeable about these things. That They want some of them now, but they also get to a position where they have to deal with the realities of what, what the business is today. So they're looking for sort of that blending of, I call it kind of the, you know, some of the traditional services, but around the edges, they want to be able to have the new technology that's there. More the, more the uh, uh, you know, the kind of almost like uh, the terminals on that, on that end, they want all the convenience of today's technology, but at the same time, they want the connectivity in, you know, who knows where in the, in the world. Mm -hmm. I guess like lots of uh, businesses as they mature from the end user's point of view, all of the stuff which in the early days of the industry were forefront, the satellite, uh, et cetera, are going to become uh, invisible to us. How, how the data gets to us uh, as consumers, businesses or, or consumers will be, uh, in, you know, it's not something that we'll particularly concern ourselves with, I would guess. Eric, did you want to? I would add, um, even the government-owned systems are experiencing, you know, perhaps a more modest, but nonetheless a, a revolution. Uh, so the government is clearly looking to uh, continue the leasing of commercial capacity, which is significant. But uh, they're also looking to dramatically increase the bandwidth of their government-owned systems. So the Navy's <laughs> narrow brand system is going from what was traditionally a, a transponded spot beam system where it had pretty finite capacity to a 3G, essentially a cell tower in the sky where you'll have point-to-point -point capability and, and everybody with the right terminal can communicate with anybody else with that same terminal. Mm -hmm. So that type of technology that the Navy has in their uh, mobile user objective system, or MUOS as we fondly refer to it, um, is, is very much. And, and even in the protected comm, the strategic command and control domain, we're seeing dramatic increases in the amount of bandwidth that's required um, and more for tactical use uh, as, as opposed to just strategic use, which requires significant increases in capacity. Mm -hmm. You know, this conference uh, the, that I alluded to when I was introducing Jacob um, uh, turned out, uh, perhaps by design, to focus a lot on uh, the Pentagon's, uh, let's call it, innovation initiative. There, there are various manifestations of it, the innovation initiative, the third offset, um, the Secretary of Defense's outreach to Silicon Valley. Um, and, and lo and behold, one of the very first things that, uh, that, that was said in this, in this uh, panel discussion uh, concerned uh, the convergence of, uh, of uh, com commercial um, and, and, and military technology. I, I suppose what I'm, what I'm uh, introducing here is a question uh, asking 
uh, about about the the um, interface, the co commingling of uh, of perhaps a a sort of rarefied space industry with a with a uh, high tech, let's call it uh, for the sake of a shorthand, Silicon Valley. Uh, do each of you have some um, uh, in interface or, or observation about how uh, the really new uh, businesses of the commercial economy are, are affecting are affecting either from a technology point of view or conceivably as customers uh, your businesses? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot at, at that. I, I think it's first of all, it's really important. I think to understand that what drives what's driving the commercial demand. Uh, is the same applications that drive the government, right? So video, for example, is one of the largest government applications as well. <coughs> um, the, the collection of data, uh, like our remote sensing systems, like a skybox imaging, right? The government has their own satellites to do that, but what they're collecting is very similar, and what mm -hmm. they're trying to move is very similar. I think in their outreach to Silicon Valley, what they're trying to grasp is how to change the business model because that's what really has to, has to modernize in the government. Commercial is going to be there to meet a lot of the communication and imaging needs that the, that the military and the government is going to have in the future. The key thing that has to change is how they go about acquiring that. And that's where, I think, to Paul's point, we're seeing a lot of the, the government <coughs> start to talk about buying services instead of leasing bandwidth. Mm -hmm. um, do they need to own and control their own systems, or can they rely on the commercial sector because we're moving at a much more rapid pace and with business models that make a lot of sense for the military to take advantage of? Let me buy what I need when I need it instead of building a satellite program that's going to, over 25 years, outdate them very quickly in terms of technology. And where within the military application space can I take advantage of what commercial is already going to do? There will always be very highly protected and important military missions that Lockheed and others will address with their own satellite systems. Mm -hmm. But there's a vast majority of what the military can do in the future. Can, they can do it very well on, on commercial systems. So they look at Silicon Valley, really they should be looking at, at some of the other companies that even aren't in Silicon Valley to say, how do I take advantage of where you guys are going? And it's really about the business model too. Mm -hmm. If, mm -hmm. if I could pile on on that, because uh, I totally agree with what Kay just said. Um, if you look back at sort of how the commercial space sector emerged, it largely was driven by government investments into government systems for uniquely government purposes. And then that was sort of the industrial and technology base that fostered the, the commercial space sector. We've seen that completely over time shift right. to where now it's the commercial sector that's largely driving the government's uh, appetite and interest. And the technology is largely being um, uh, uh, originated or matured in the commercial sector. And these ideas are now going to be flowing into the government. So you see almost a complete uh, reversal of, of the flow of, of technology. Uh, in, and I mentioned the convergence. It's not that suddenly today we see this happening. It's actually been happening over time, gradually over about a 30-year period of time. We, we, you know, our government satellites are largely based on a commercial design that originated them. We're, when I mentioned this technology refresh of our commercial, mm -hmm. the reason we're doing that is not just because we want to be more competitive commercially, but we want a product that then the government can then leverage into their systems as well. So I think that's a, an increasing and accelerating trend. So if, if I may, I mean, this, this was a, both of these responses are, are quite articulate on, on exactly what I think Secretary Carter is looking and, and hoping for, and, and something of an antidote, if I may say it, to some of the cynicism toward the prospects of, of that initiative out of the Pentagon that, that I more generally hear. Um, uh, uh, even more technically, if I, not that you weren't speaking also technically, but um, are there technologies, semiconductor, uh, software, uh, materials uh, perhaps, that are, are in the commercial sector, again, let's use the shorthand, although it's not quite correct, uh, Silicon Valley, um, that are turning out to be, to be important to the technical innovations in, in your systems? Um, Jay, you got anybody scouting through Silicon Valley for solutions to your technical problems? Well, I, I'd say because of who we are, you're not going to see a lot of uh, overlap mm -hmm. with, with the Valley. Uh, that's really where our customers are. 
Uh, yeah. I would say, back to your earlier point, if, if you're, you're interested, um, we, we started out uh, purely as a commercial endeavor. Um, we don't really have any uh, subsidies or relationships with the government uh, to provide us funding. Um, and we don't have a large financial benefactor that has a passion for the industry. So we're truly, not only are we the black t-shirt guys, we're the one, one black t-shirt guys uh, that we turn them inside out and look for the couches for the change. Um, but what this does is this produces a very innovative, very agile, and very aggressive environment. Uh, what's interesting is we believe there's applications for our mission profile in a national security environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, coincidentally, our spacecraft will fit in a 130. Uh, you can fly multiple times a day above the threat zone. And uh, most recently, I've, I've met with some folks inside the, the building across the river and discussed who we are and what we do. Uh, and they said, we're very interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, I looked, it, it, it I spin back on, I guess one might. Well, and I looked it. at him and said, "We have no interest in doing business with you." Uh, and I got an odd look, but unless been, they'll make a contribution to the laundry fund. Well, and I, I've been on both sides, and I know how it works. And yeah. you chase that, like moths to the flame, you chase that down, and you find yourself perhaps now structuring yourself and doing business in a way you really didn't want to. Uh, I said, but what we will do is we'll be successful commercially, and then you can call us in a FAR-12 environment and buy all you want, mm -hmm. sure. which gets back to part of what's been said here. Mm -hmm. So uh, short term, um, perhaps some of our shareholders might think I'm not very bright, but I'm hoping we're setting ourselves up to truly have a good relationship for us and for them to buy the services as they need and have a very long, profitable relationship versus, in our case, just seeking funding. If I okay. could, it, it's, it's accepting that commercial model, right, versus you changing to fit into the government model, I think is, is kind of what you're saying, right? Absolutely. I mean, and, I, again, I've seen it from both sides, and I know how it works, and um, you, you, you can't be partly pregnant. Right. You, I mean, you have to either... You're either buying go on that price way or, or go you're this not. way. Well, well and we're trying to save the government from their own faults, right? Which is they do need to break that model. Mm -hmm. They're 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 going to go out to Silicon Valley to hear what? They're going to hear the same thing we've been saying back here in Washington D.C., which is we're we're a service-based company. We can build great economics into your business as well, but you have to be willing to accept that model. So let's get an acquisition approach that allows you to take advantage of all this new technology that commercial is investing in. Because investment doesn't just come from Silicon Valley. All these companies up here are investing. Right. You know, Lockheed's investing in new, in new uh, technologies for their spacecraft. Clay's investing in, new, in a new launcher. I'm investing in platforms, you know, mm -hmm. but we've got to make sure the government is poised to take advantage of those investments. When they go to Silicon Valley, they're going to hear the same thing, mm -hmm. except that that audience is not as used to serving the government as we are. Right. Get back to your technology Please. question for mm -hmm. a second. So yep. a lot of, and a, a number of them were mentioned here, but maybe just to pull them out a little bit. So Kate, Kate talked about metamaterials, mm -hmm. so flat panel designs uh, that you don't need a dish that's actually tracking a spacecraft in orbit. It's able to see spacecraft as they're passing over with a flat panel. It could be on a car, it could be on a plane, it could be on the top of the roof of a building, easy to install. It's not like you have to point the dish and do any. So this kind of thing, and, and if they mm -hmm. can get to a point where this is a low cost material, and so companies like Chimeta, which I think Bill Gates has invested quite heavily mm -hmm. in this company. Mm -hmm. uh, th these are companies that are game changing. Uh, you know, for us, it's the use of carbon fiber. Sure. It's uh, advanced materials, advanced manufacturing techniques to try to reduce the weight of the launch vehicle itself right. uh, and to try to increase the performance of the system uh, of what we're doing. Uh, I think you, you see a lot with software on, on the side of the software business mm -hmm. um, to be able to take either the ones and zeros coming from space and to, to take that data and be able to process it quite rapidly see the changes in the data, patterns, you know, how many cars are in a parking lot is the one that's always used, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of other applications you can look at for agriculture, for, uh, for uh, uh, business and economics on the ground, 
where you're taking advanced computing and software and be able to find a real uh, actionable, uh, serviceable product at the end of that day. Right. And so, so these are the types of things that we're seeing that are advancing the case of space today that, that really we hadn't seen here before, I think. Uh, and we talked a little bit about software-defined satellites and being able to uh, take what was military technology, I think originally, and to adapt that technology so you have what is in effect a fungible satellite. So they're building a big geo satellite. It's going to last 15 years, design life in orbit. But in the old days, you had a beam shape that was fixed. So it was very difficult to move that satellite around to some other part right, of the world right. and be able to utilize it. Yep. Right? So now you've got a software, that, software, a defined satellite that can really reconfigure the beam on its own. So you've got a fungible asset, mm -hmm. much like a commercial aircraft, by the way, that can be repositioned and sold to another airline. And you can think about the financing and the other downstream pieces of that. Right. Those assets are now fungible, can be resold, they can be financed much more easily, like mm -hmm. an aircraft. Mm -hmm. Okay, I uh, did say I would turn to the audience, and I'm going to do that after one last question, so cue your questions. Uh, my last question actually picks up from, from something that uh, we were talking about uh, in the, the, the so-called green room, and that is uh, how crowded low Earth orbit is getting. And I wonder if I could just uh, revisit that, that, that topic, uh, if only to sort of put on the public record a certain degree of alarm, actually, uh, maybe a considerable alarm that I was hearing about, about the problem. Um, anybody want to, to uh, 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 um, animate my, my, uh, my question there? There's a lot of stuff in low Earth orbit. It's getting crowded. Um, thousands, of, thousands more satellites are uh, scheduled to be put into low Earth orbit. Um, maybe, maybe let me reformulate the question. Does government uh, need to do something to more effectively regulate uh, the traffic uh, that we've got coming? So, so I would point out that you know, the government is often talking about space as a congested, contested, and um, you know, so congested Even the, today it's e congested and, and, before. And even today, um, it places a, a premium on space situational awareness, knowing what's there, but even then it requires something beyond that. Uh, certainly you have to start with ability to not only um, uh, identify objects, but also maintain custody of them. Where are they going? This gets into a whole conversation about resilience, which is very important to, uh, to the government about um, how survivable are our systems in potentially conflict environments and, and the like. But it all starts with being able to have very good space situational awareness in the first instance. Um, beyond that, um, I'm not an authority to speak on regulatory changes that are required, but um, presumably the government will have to deal with the problem of you know, just an increasingly congested environment in space. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, if we want to commercialize space, which we all do, right. Uh, it is a domain that requires protection. It's a limited resource. We have to protect it. <clears throat> and so I think what we see right now is we see the U.S. government really, they, they take on the burden and the responsibility of space traffic management, specifically the JSPOC, the Joint Space Operations Center, does that. They do it free of charge, and they do it for any spacefaring in individual entity, university, or country. And the, the real question is, can they continue to play that role uh, when space is increasing in it, the number of objects on an exponential uh, platform? So what is, what is going to be the future role of the JSPOC? You know, should they be the space traffic managers? There's talk right now, there's debate going on as to whether there could be some kind of FAA role or more of a global international role in order to do space traffic management, because we're not the only ones putting up a lot of things into Hardly. LEO and GEO, right? The whole world is. So, so we do, you know, I'm not one to ask for regulation, but we need to be on top of this so that we don't ruin the space domain for all of the people that want to commercialize space. And there's a tragedy of the commons at play here, right? right. I mean, we all need to be able to use that and operate in that, in that domain. And so if we don't find ways to act uh, as, good, as good actors, good players in that domain, we're, we're going to have pro problems as, as we look to field more of these systems. We can't have people launching things that they can't control, that they can't maneuver, that they can't track. And they're just throwing that responsibility to somebody else right now. That, mm -hmm. that, can't, that is not a good position to be in. Jay, I'm sure you've, I'm sorry, Paul. I was just going to say, in the view from the coal faces, there's no doubt that where there are more and more issues of interference, we get called by a customer. I, I was at a Air Force base two weeks ago, and I, I got kind of this lecture where somebody said, I had bought a home, but it looks like more like a condo. 
And the point being that there are, by virtue of the fact that there are other satellites that are in the area there, they're getting interference issues that are popping up and they're looking mm. for sort of solutions to that problem. And that's before all this great stuff gets launched today. Right. Right, they call it Homer's Association. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Jay, Jay I, I can imagine uh, a, a future customer of XCOR who wants uh, you to go up there and clean something up. Oh, I think that I, I would say what's being said, yes, yes, and yes. Um, however, I look at it as great opportunity. <laughs> yeah. So if, if we can provide, any of us can provide affordable, frequent access, that ecosystem starts to take on a life of its own. I'd love to be waste management right. and say, I got it. I figured out how to deal with debris. And you start to generate, its again, its whole economic model of its own. Uh, so uh, I think there's a great opportunity there. OK. All right. And oh, good. Excellent. I will start right there, the gentleman in the third row. Uh, hold your hands up if you have questions so I can register where I've got them um, here for a second. OK. Let's go, Michael. We'll go pretty quickly, please. I would ask each of you. Michael Bruno with Aviation Week and Space Technology. Traditionally, the business cases for space work has been measured in decades. It takes deep pockets to get into it. Um, f fleets of birds cost a lot of money, and, and the business cases are long-term. Is that getting any shorter, or do you still see long-term um, plans for return on investments? Anybody? I think for the new space companies, it's definitely a shorter timeline. Right. So if you're talking about these guys who are building small satellites that are, are, are able to produce those satellites ra rather quickly, not in a traditional two, three year time frame to build a big geostationary platform, but in uh, less than 18 months or sometimes even a year or even less if you're talking about CubeSats, uh, these guys are looking for launch opportunities for my company much more quickly than a traditional player. We would typically sign a contract about two years out from launch. They'd sign the satellite contract about three years out, launch contract about two years, 18 months out, and then actually get to launch. These guys are looking at much more compressed timelines, and it's something we need to adapt to. OK, there's a question here uh, at the edge. And then when, when we're done, I'm going to go to that gentleman right there after that. John Sheldon, Atlantic Council. Uh, question for the whole panel. Uh, given the dynamism you've been talking about, given the convergence between government and commercial, what are the implications long term for the US export control regime for space issues? Export control. I used to be an expert on this, so maybe I'll wade into it with a Please. I'll tiptoe into it. So All I right. used to run the Satellite Industry Association a long time ago, and that, okay, and that yeah. was, was a huge issue before us. And, and, and thankfully, after uh, almost a decade of work, uh, now a lot of the control for commercial communication satellite technology has been returned to the Commerce Department. And, and uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of companies start to adapt uh, to that new system of licensing that should be uh, a lot easier, particularly for working with allied nations. And so that's hopefully going to free up a lot of this stuff that's really uh, the, the, the commercial, off-the-shelf type of communication satellite technology that doesn't really need to have those kind of high walls, particularly when you're dealing with allied nations and you're talking about building and selling something that's going to be put into orbit and the access to that technology is not going to be uh, readily available to anyone to be able to thwart. Uh, I would say on the launch piece of it, it all stays on the ITAR. And so all my licensing still has to be done uh, under state department control, under uh, def defense uh, controls. And so it, not that much has really changed from my side because launch technology is, is a protective technology. But I will say this, the government has done a very good job at trying to adapt to, to try to be quick and responsive. Uh, I think today the issue right now is that transition to the Commerce Department and some companies doing dual licensing on two different tracks. And that's a bit of an administrative headache and wondering what's on what list. And, Trying to make that work in a practical sense is, is going to take a little bit of time. But once I think that, that you get through that interim period, it's going to hopefully be a, a much better process. OK, this gentleman here, then I'm going to come to, uh, as courtesy to, my, uh, to Jacob. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Roy McCall, independent analyst. A question for Clayton Maury. Uh, in the transition from GEO to LEO, uh, what sort of uh, robotic technologies set you apart, possibly, as a European company? And are you? not cooperating with Swiss space systems to develop a debris catcher in space? I'm not aware that we're cooperating with Swiss space systems, although I'm aware of what they're proposing uh, for, for a launch system to low Earth orbit. Uh, robotic technology, geez, I, I, again, I think it's a bit uh, far afield in terms of, you're talking about orbital debris removal or in manufacturing? Launch into LEO, uh, remote control launch, and launch of small satellites. 
so, so our, our low Earth orbit systems, we operate two systems, the Vega and the Soyuz system, all right? So the Vega system is our new light launcher. It's flown five times. We, in fact, have a launch coming up on December 2nd with the Lisa Pathfinder mission. Uh, so far, 100% success. We're launching uh, Google Skybox next summer on that launch system. And we're looking at uh, different types of deployment mechanisms to be able to do much more of a standardized approach to, to deploying these uh, constellations. And so in a, in a typical geo world, I'm doing two satellites at a time. We know what the standard transfer orbit they're going on. They're all going more or less the same place, the same time, and the same kind of performance. With a low-Earth orbit system, it's a lot more complicated. You've got different local times. Some are dawn, dusk. Others are at 10.30 in the morning. Others in the afternoon. Uh, local time, ascending node, descending node. Some guys want to go to 600 kilometers. Other guys, 500 or 700. So you have to have a system that's flexible enough, an upper stage, that can drop people off at different orbits and then to deorbit itself so that we don't leave debris up there. So these are technologies we're actually moving quite rapidly to be able to upgrade that system, more launch performance, standardized launch environment, and be able to really rapidly deploy a lot of these constellations. So it's a challenge, I'll have to say. It's not something that, you know, getting our minds around this and working with ELV, who's our prime contractor for, for Vega, uh, we're, we're really trying to push hard to do that quickly. Um, but we're not maybe as, as fast as the Silicon Valley guys. The launch technology, the physics involved are a little bit harder. But we're getting there. I think by 2018, 2019, we're going to have a very, very capable system. Okay, we'll take Jacob's question, and then we're going to take a question from this gentleman here on, this, on the aisle. Uh, folks, a really good discussion, I thought. And a lot of it touched on a couple of different ideas, or many, that could fundamentally transform the entire on-orbit and also launch infrastructure, sort of the hardware that we have both flying into space and back as well as in orbit. Does, does each of you or any of you have a, a vision for what things might look like in space five, 10 years from now? And will they be dramatically different, right? Will it be thousands of satellites supporting thousands of reusable flights? Will it be not that different from today? What's your, what's your vision of the future? I, I'll offer the thought that um, we, we've seen um, evolutionary approaches to, to space development as being a very um, um, a good way to bound both risk and cost. Uh, now, that's not to say that you're not going to have any breakthrough uh, revolutionary approaches, but uh, when I talked about convergence, as I mentioned earlier, that's not something that happened just overnight. It happened over a period of time. And so I think it'll be a combination of uh, new, um, even the, by the way, even the distributed uh, small satellite, uh, Iridium, we should remember back. I mean, it's flying 70 or 80 satellites. And so the, you know, that approach, and those were built um, and launched in a very similar fashion, many at a time, very rapidly, very low cost. So um, I think it's going to be a combination. Um, some of the government missions don't lend themselves as well to sort of quick, um, I mean, they're, we're still bound by the laws of physics. So um, small satellites can do many things very well. Uh, large satellites uh, do other things uh, that only large satellites, at least for now, can only do. I, I think, um, and I don't mean to wander into your domain too much, but you know, in the future, I think reusable launch is going to be absolutely uh, a game changer whenever we can get some of the key breakthrough technologies. We're, we're still somewhat um, bound to uh, traditional uh, propulsion technology, and, and, and I think we'll see that change eventually. Anybody else? I'm, uh, Paul? I, I might add, just okay. as maybe a little bit of an outsider, I mean, I see parallels to what happened in the, in the terrestrial world. I mean, if you look at what happened when, you know, you had the Bells and the Baby Bells and Ilex and Celex and all that sort of stuff that happened, and then ultimately you ended up having a windowing, if you will, of the of the different uh, networks that existed out there in the market. And I think that's probably inevitable at some point in time where there'll be some sort of survival of the fittest and some sort of coming together of technologies and some sort of things. I mean, OneWeb is a kind of a classic uh, part of that, but invariably there's gonna be kinds of um, survival of the fittest, if you will, and parallels in my mind to what happened in the, in the telephony and the data world. Okay. I'll just add, our, I think our vision of the future would have us um, see much more uh, from the manufacturers of digitalization of our satellites, therefore very highly flexible, shapeable beams. Uh, we'll be able to allocate power. We'll be able to change frequencies in orbit. Uh, we would envision uh, in five years that we would have in-orbit refueling capability, and Intelsat will be taking advantage of that to extend the life of that very flexible satellite. We'll see launch costs and launch systems introduced that would allow us to complement our large geo satellites, which may, with maybe some smaller, uh, more mission-centric satellites. 
Um, I think all of those things. And then on the ground, we're going to see very highly mobile um, antennas using the electronic electronically steered arrays. Uh, things like Phaser and Chimeta will be deployed by then and will be interconnected potentially with OneWeb uh, within five years. Thank you. Right here. And then I'm going to go to this gentleman in the third row. Please, Steve. Hi, uh, Stephen Gannot from Avacent. Um, we've talked a lot, you know, I think very interestingly, about essentially democratizing or making more affordable access to space, right? Modularity, in orbit propulsion, small sats, production lines, you know, interoperability between fiber and satellite. Um, there's a lot of talk in the industry right now about supply demand balance. And if you look at the amount of capacity going up and you take Viasat two, three, four seriously, you're throwing a lot of capacity out of orbit with demand that's coming, but you don't have, you know, if you've got a 50-50 LEO to GEO mix in your satellites over the next few years, what's the revenue and backlog mix geo to leo right so there's a, a pretty clear imbalance in, in favor of traditional geostationary satellites but you throw up that much capacity that clearly cheapens the price per megabit the price elasticity there so where might the demand trigger come in terms of pulling that capacity up to meet the supply or the supply to meet the capacity else we risk as some of us lived through 15 years ago the last leo boom that resulted in a lot of bankruptcies and a pretty you know, significant trough in the industry that was saved only by government demand for, you know, for three or four years. So kind of wondering, all that capacity driving down the price per bit, what's, what gets triggered in terms of the application that might take up that capacity to a point that makes this more economic? So a, a skeptic to the presumption that, that we can never have enough capacity. Um, Okay, yeah, wanna... sure. So again, I think you know I I like to look at um, this in in two ways. First, we still have the problem of connecting four billion people, and we're talking about basic rural telephony. We haven't even gotten to the use of of internet in the in that kind of way. So we need to do that. That that's going to drive demand, especially in some of the BRIC countries, uh, you know, Brazil and and Russia and India and and China. So there's a lot of that in rural Africa, for example. So there's a lot, lot of demand that we believe will come from that. Very price elastic demand as well. The second piece of that, though, are applications that are enabled by this cost per bit, this lower cost per bit, and this, the capability of higher powered satellites. And we believe, just think about the connected car. Just think about the amount of data that a connected car would drive, would, would drive onto a system. It's, it's absolutely mind-boggling to think about. So the internet of things and the devices that are out there that are potentials to be connected, even at GEO, even without the LEO constellations, things that can actually talk to GEO are expanding exponentially. So there are applications that will be triggered by the capability of space and the fact that the price per bit has gotten to a point where the investment of making that available, connected car probably being the best example, could, could proliferate. Anybody else? What about these? Um, uh, is, there, uh, uh, is, is there the potential for competition with terrestrial uh, uh, cell phone towers? Well, but think about that. I mean, terrestrial drives local content. That content has to be collected and distributed. When you're using your, your iPhone, much of what you're sending is not going locally. It's going someplace else. Mm -hmm. You're drawing from the internet. Yeah. Satellite has a huge play in all of that globally. We may not feel that here in the United States, but right. when you look abroad, we have a huge play in that globally. Right. A, a five gigabyte plan used to be more than you'd ever possibly need. Well, well it ain't anymore. Right. We <laughs> one of the applications over the top uh, of the terrestrial network, unclogging the terrestrial choke points. This is another place where satellite will help mm -hmm. dramatically. You know, when we start connecting all of these devices, they will be connected locally. We will choke the fiber system. So satellite provides a very good complement. Over the top of that fiber system will be satellite capability. Still, perhaps a, a, a salutary cautionary note there, Steve. Thank you. Could I get a refresh of hands uh, who have questions? OK, sir? I'm Pat Hose. I'm Pat Hose from the Hold on one second, Pat. We don't have this thing going. Help me, please. There we go. Hi, I'm Pat Hose from Defense Daily. Uh, Kay, why didn't the Virginia Commercial Space Flight Authority pick up the tab for the balance of repairs at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport? 
And then if you could hand that microphone to the gentleman in front of you, Kay. I will in Kay. just a second. Uh, I would have to defer that to, um, to the Mars team and... Uh, but you're on the board. I am on the board. I'm not at liberty to talk about it, though. What kind of message does it send? Uh, what you. kind of message Pat. does it send when... Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. The question to this gentleman with the white shirt on. Thanks. Um, I've got a question for, um, for Lockheed, definitely. Also for XCorp. Anybody else pile on? There was this fellow who used to work for you guys at Lockheed, Augustine, I think, who uh, said a lot of things. Um, and I, I, I love some of the pithiness because the, the, a lot of things he said I think are sort of half true, but you learn a lot by trying to figure out what part of it's true and what's not. But there was that famous line about, um, you know, it's a perfect track record in the defense industry for commercial diversification. It never, ever works. So Lockheed Martin, I think, is itself a, a, a counterexample because you guys do commercial stuff. And as you're saying, I think you did a really good job of laying that out. And I mean, I could point to Boeing. I could say all the helicopter companies, including yours, they do commercial and, and military. But they've been doing it, y'all have been doing it for a very long time. Um, so you've sort of built up institutions for knowing how to do both, and there's a cost to doing business for the government side. Then I got the X-Corps guy here who says, yeah, forget that. DIUX, whatever, I'm not interested. I, I, I'm just not going to do that. Um, DOD very much wants people like him to come in too. You guys are already there. I'm wondering, did Norm have this exactly backwards? that the track record for commercial diversification into military businesses is really, really bad or really hard to do is. And is that then actually a source of competitive advantage for you all? OK, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll try to der derive an answer. <laughs> um, so what I would say is we hear the term commercial used a lot. And it means a lot of different things depending. Um, and so you really have to sort of get into what do you mean by commercial? Uh, th there are very few um, uh, purely commercial um, uh, plays in the space arena that don't, to some extent, lean on some government investment. Uh, there are some, but not that many. And perhaps there are going to be more in the future. I think uh, communications now is certainly one of those that exists purely as a commercial uh, business. Having established that, now commercial capability can be uh, leased back to the government. So it was those sort of commercial investments that created it. But uh, if you look at most of uh, the examples that I'm aware of, uh, launch being certainly one of those, the government has always been asked to come in, and whether you want to use the word subsidize or invest, uh, to, to help enable the emergence of a commercial a player there. Certainly the EELV program was like. NASA's commercial crew and cargo programs are essentially um, really government programs, but they are, they're being run through a, a commercial business model. Back to Kay's point about it's a, a lot about the business model. So um, I, I think you have to really get in and look at each one of these examples case by case. Um, you know, yes, there have been a number of examples where we said there's a commercial marketplace. I'll go back to the EELV example. It was postulated that there was going to be this humongous growth in launch opportunities, largely uh, foiled. I think we heard the reference to the, the crash of the last round of LEO uh, projections about where that was all going. So that actually took down the EELV program as a commercial program along with it. Um, and the government had to bring that back essentially as a, as a government program. Um, that's not to say that, that, that the government didn't get significant benefit. They also got significant benefit out of Iridium, even though that crashed as a commercial uh, endeavor and, and went bankrupt. And then the government has now uh, you know, bought into it. Now it's a, it's a going venture. My only point really being is um, significant government investment is often required to help enable these, these commercial uh, ventures. Not always, and I know many of the, the new space, um, so-called new space players uh, shun government investment because they're afraid of the strings that could come attached to it, but um, many of them have only succeeded through, uh, through government investment. It, it must be said that a, another feature economically of dynamism is failure is uh, uh, enter en enterprises coming and going. Um, and so when we see that in this exciting space sector, um, let's not please uh, write the stories that said uh, it, it was all a, uh, you know, a mirage.
um, because that would be uh, that would be the wrong inference to draw. Well, we have time here at the top of the hour just for me to allow each of you to uh, put a final word um, on the proceedings. And, and if you're, you're struggling for something to say, my question would be the one you might 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 choose to answer, but you don't have to. Is um, uh, what are the fundamental things that, that still apply? Um, we've talked mostly about what's new, uh, but uh, what are the fundamentals that, that, that still apply and will have to apply for this uh, exciting industry to uh, realize its, its, its great ambition? Uh, maybe we'll just walk right down the line, please. Sure. Uh, so we haven't directly talked about cost, and obviously cost is a huge motivator for the government, for the commercial. So innovation is not only pursued for the sake of capability, but it's also <clears throat> pursued for the sake of reducing cost. And increasingly, we're not going to be uh, able to, uh, to justify uh, whether they're government programs or commercial programs at the same cost structure that we've gotten used to. So mm -hmm. I think all of us in the collective space sector are grappling um, and, and I think making great progress in terms of reducing overhead, reducing cost, and, and, and innovating for cost reduction. Thank you very much for coming and participating today. Clay. Uh, I've been doing satellite launch for over 20 years. I'd say this today is the most exciting time I've ever seen in the, in the commercial space business right now. Yeah. It is changing very rapidly. There's a lot of private sector investment that's coming into play. Uh, all this launch capacity, as some of the folks in the audience talked about, is coming online. Uh, it is a very exciting time, and watching companies, both old and new, adapt to those new and changing markets is really going to be what's the key uh, driver for this business as we go forward. Uh, you know, just a few things for, from the launch perspective. We've got to get better, more responsive, more standardized. We've got to be able to adapt our launch systems and be able to serve our customers better and more quickly. And so I think we're all working to do that very, right more now. More standardized and adaptable, hard, hard task. Uh, it's, 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 there's two things. I'm not things. picking on you. I'm no, saying no, no, that's no. what it, it requires. There's two pieces of that. One, I mean, it's, it's making it easy for your customer to come. Here's the interface. Yep. Here's the environment you're going to fly in. You design the satellite to that, we're going to put you up there very quickly. Right. So when I say standardization, it means making it easier for them to mm -hmm. ride with us. Yep. Paul, despite and, all and the thank things, you, Clay. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I mean, despite all of the, the things that are going on, it always comes back down to the value proposition. I don't care where you are and what the technology changes. It's all about the application of that technology for the customer. And at the end of the day, customers want to be near people who can help them. And if you can provide help and provide objective or, uh, advice to them on helping with the issues and problems that they're dealing with. They want more of your time. So they want to know about all the new things that are going on. They want those things today. They, uh, but they also have very, very real sort of uh, conflicts in their world. They have budget pressures. They have technology pressures. They have things they bought in the past. And they're looking for people who can help them sort of sort through all that. And it sounds like we got great things that are going on in, in the future. And I'm sure that uh, the market will be bright for those things. One of the fundamentals that still applies is customers' needs are complicated, um, uh, and, and, and uh, just that. Jay, and, and thank you, Paul. Thank you. So, Steve, thanks for You're allowing welcome. us to participate. Um, to what Eric said, I would just say amen. Uh, that uh, when you think back where all the cell phones you have 25 years ago, uh, if you'd envisioned that you would today do your banking, book your travel, you probably would have said, no, no, no way. But when something becomes very affordable, very uh, frequently available, and very capable, the free market does a wonderful job of finding a way to utilize it. And I think that's exactly where we're going to be. Someone describes us, say, well, you guys are just going to kind of like be like Boeing. I said, that's OK with me. So uh, I think that's where we're going. Mm -hmm. OK. And finally, Kay, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I, I would, you know, one thing that hasn't changed since I've been in the satellite and space industry, it's always been competitive. So any company that stood still and didn't innovate isn't here today. So we're still here today, Inelsat. We're, we've been here for 50 years. We're going to continue to innovate. Space is cool again. Satellites are cool again. That's great. Um, I think this new space business is all about partnerships. It's all about the value chain. It's relying on partners in the value chain to, to deliver their piece of it so that we can all uh, take advantage of, of the new technology. Thank you, and thanks to all of you. So this, this conversation lived up to my every uh, pretty high expectation of what we could get out of it. And uh, I, I, I thank the panel very much for uh, putting some meat to, to, to the, those bones. Thanks very much to all of you for coming, for asking questions, very great uh, intelligent questions, and for those of you who may have been watching on, online. Um, I'll repeat that the, those two slides, I, I believe, Alex, please confirm for me the two slides 
uh, that Jacob used are available to you uh, in paper outside the room. Uh, uh, watch this space. We'll, we'll do more of this uh, in, in the year ahead. Thanks.